Go, 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 go. Um, thank you everyone for coming this evening and we hope you enjoy yourselves and uh, learn something from Sarah and feel free to ask questions at question time. Um, and then I've got to tell you that the loos, which I visited, very smart suite, are downstairs. There's a lift and uh, there's the exit. If you smell smoke, just get up and run in that kind of direction um, and oh sorry or that one <laughs> I wouldn't know which one or that one I mean you know hey it's up to you but anyway if you smell smoke get up and run and we'll see you outside um, I am going to start by introducing Sarah Sarah Usher who is a, a lifelong friend I've known her all ever since we were you know about that big and um, we, we used to go to the pony club together, poor, poor pony club, and, and various hunter trials. And, uh, and our dear parents would drive us 180 miles, and then we would start the show jumping before the bell. <laughs> or, or, you know, that's do exactly, the wrong dressage test. Exactly or, and um, <laughs> most nice mothers would, would say, never mind, dear. But my mother would have you up against the back of the wagon and be sorting you out <laughs> after poor, poor thing, having driven us for miles and miles. Anyway, um, we, uh, no, it didn't work, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, Sarah and I got rather fed up with the pony club and <laughs> doing quadrille and all that nonsense. So um, luckily, we both had very, very keen uh, hunting parents. And um, once we were allowed to go hunting, that was it. And we became um, completely <laughs> obsessed. And um, there was, you know, never ending. I bet you don't, you know, you're not going to jump that. And I bet you haven't jumped that. And I bet you wouldn't dare do that. And of course, we did all these things. Um, we have jumped bridges over and under of them. We've been over many stone walls. We've been into bogs and out of bogs. And I'm not going to go on about what we've been doing, what we were doing. And, and the only time we were ever, ever seen to turn our horses in a circle is when all else had failed and our brakes were just, <laughs> they weren't working. Um, Sarah then went on to, to do the Melton Hunt ride. Um, and because, as you can tell, my physique was not, you know, was, you know <laughs> it took a bit more getting in shape. Um, but Sarah did the Melton Hunt ride. She used to point to point an open team chase. And um, at that point, I was very, very happy to be a uh, ground crew. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, or will, you'll see later, Sarah has studied. Um, horsemanship all over the world, in France, in Australia, America. And she, <laughs> she has always, ever since I've known Sarah, I think she's always felt that the horse's lot was not a very happy one. And she has made it her life's work to try and teach us really stupid humans to um, speak the language a horse can understand instead of one we assume they can understand. Um, Sarah's really landed on her feet, moving from Yorkshire to Suffolk since Christopher, her husband, has retired. And she now lives in Darsham and is sandwiched between Paula Block and me. <laughs> so she can't, she's not going anywhere. So um, you know where she is if you need her. Anyway, Sarah Usher. Thank you very much, B. It's not tamer than I thought it might be, so I'm fairly relieved. Um, leave my mic alone. Of course, I'm not Umi. Um, Can you leave your mic alone? Thank you, Umi, very much for asking me here again to talk at your wonderful science cafe. And I hope you'll all bear with me, because I've only done this twice in my life without a horse, and this is the second time. So bear with if it goes um, pear-shaped at any stage. Um, 
I have been always obsessed, as Bea said, with learning about horses and how they work. Right from an early age, I've absolutely adored them. Even through my wild times, I've been wondering, what, why can't I do this? What's wrong with this? And um, I had many lessons from brilliant people, um, many riding lessons, and all the time riding lessons. All I really want as a child. What do you want for your birthday? Riding lessons. And I think the reason why we're doing so well in this country now um, with dressage, show jumping and um, eventing, we are really at the top of our game and I'm sure it's because we have the most amazing coaches. But I was interested in behaviour. And I think Monty Roberts was the first man to pop his head up to say, hello, I can do help you with a horse that bucks or whatever. So I went straight off to learn with Kelly Marks for a week about round pen went work, etc. And this was really the start, and I, it gave me a hunger to learn more. The next thing I did was I, went, I heard about this thing called Pirelli. And so I bought the kit and everything, and I did a massive amount from learning videos, from watching videos, and then going out and doing it on my poor horse. And I really enjoyed doing this, and it changed my horses. Pirelli taught me several things, but the main thing it taught me was timing and reading a horse, and also balance and the feel that you had to give a horse to make him do what you wanted to do or make him help him to do what you wanted to do. I was then sent to um, France to learn a bit more about natural horsemanship because there was a splinter group from Pirelli who quite rightly thought that they didn't want this natural horsemanship lark to be out of the sort of mainstream of um, competition and normal riding. So I was sent there to learn and to accelerate my learning and to become an instructor. I had the most inspirational instructor called Andy Booth, who wasn't only an instructor, but he was incredibly funny. And my God, bees met him. We laughed so Very much. Very handsome and girls. Can you hear? Okay. And he, became, he was incredible. And he's now, he's a great, still a tremendous friend. I was then told I had to go to Texas. So, of course, I did. Because there was a man there called... Bruce, uh, Bruce Logan, who I needed to go and learn stuff from. So off I went for two weeks. And apart from learning to use a lasso, um, catch horses, catch with cattle, and ride across the beautiful country of Texas, I think Bruce was way ahead of his time because he really talked about the body of the horse and he taught me to get the ribs of these horses and get them soft through the ribs and then get them back onto the hind legs was really just as important for a horse as it was getting their brain right. Before Pirelli was very much about using the, getting the brain in the right place, Bruce was really understanding that the body was just as important as the brain. And the final person that I met um, was a scientist. And he is what I'm going to really talk to you about tonight, because it's this science behind the training of horses, which really is important that we understand. I spent a month at the Equine um, Behaviour Centre in Australia, learning from Dr. Andrew McLean, plus his son, son um, and his wife. Both, they were all very kind to me. But what I came away wa with was, um, uh, two things, uh, understanding the innate behaviour of the horse and the, san the science behind um, the training of horses and also this evidence-based techniques that he taught me. This is Luke that we B talked about earlier on and my parents bought him for my 16th birthday present. Can I just interrupt there and tell you what us locals called him? The bastard. <laughs> anyway, Luke was straight fresh off the boat from Ireland. He was four years old and he was about 15, three, 16 hands, something like that. And my mother called him Luke because she'd just seen that film, Cool Hand Luke, with Paul Newman in it. You may remember it. Anyway, Luke was anything but cool. In fact, you'd call him hot. But I was 16. God, a hot horse was just what I wanted. 
until I took him to that fateful pony club <laughs> rally. And when Luke got off the trailer, he was, had transformed himself into a complete lunatic. I couldn't get near him. He was bucking, he was rearing everything. By the time I joined the ride, about half an hour later, bright red in the face and sweating like he was, the poor instructor didn't know what to do with him because, of course, we were both rather disruptive in the class. So we were expelled. <laughs> and we were sent into a corner of the field and to do circles. Well, as Bees told you before, I didn't really know about circles in those days, so we had to go home in disgrace. Wind on 20 years, and I'm beginning to realise that um, Luke was not a teenager at a party, like I'd been told he was by lots of people at that Pony Club rally. He w didn't need to be a hot horse all his life. And he didn't need to be worked into the ground in order to be rideable. Um, and so I want to start this evening by talking about the first thing on this list, which is Luke being at a party. Think, but what really was, was his flight response. And he was absolutely blooming terrified. And I think this flight response is so misunderstood because everything we don't like in a horse originates in flight and then can turn into a learnt behaviour and then pattern. I hope you can all read this slide from where you are. I hope that's okay. If you can't, I'll leave it up during the break and you can have a better look. I'll give you a few minutes, a minute or two to look at that and just to... Um, look at some of the flight responses, which I think is quite inter are quite interesting. Um, there are some on the board that I've underlined, like bolting, bucking, rearing, shying, spinning. We all know these ones well, and they're the ones that actually send us into flight. They're the ones we really don't like. But there are one or two on that board that we might not recognise as flight. For instance, br putting on a bridle and we can't get the blooming bridle on. This is a flight response. Barging. When a horse barges, we never think it's flight. We just think, oh, blooming health, horse taking me over here, or it's pushing me out. This st originates in flight. And then um, uh, biting. This is something that people don't recognise as flight as well, and they just hit the horse or send it away or whatever. This doesn't actually ever stop the horse from biting for long. It is a flight response. Flight is a trigger that goes off in the brain. And the horse can't help it. It's something he's born with. It's his innate behavior. This is not his fault. We shouldn't call him bad names and horrible things just because he exhibits these conflict behaviours that we've just seen on the board. We shouldn't punish them for them, we should understand them. Now, I can give you another example. There's this pink balloon. And so a horse, when he sees this pink balloon, we all know this feeling, he go, <laughs> and he grows about ten hands and he be becomes the lunatic like, like Luke did, possibly. And he is trying to make, in that decision, when he sees that pink balloon, he's trying to make the decision, do I pull the trigger to go into flight or not? And he pulls that trigger and bang, he's trying to get as far, so I've got to go around B, as far away from that balloon as he can, as he thinks is necessary to save his life. The, he is trying to save his life. His innate behaviour tells him that that balloon might kill him. Now, there are five things we have to understand about flight. The first thing is that he will remember that pink balloon forever and ever and ever. It's logged in his brain. The second thing is he'll always remember where it lives. We all know this. We've all got a spooky corner in the arena. We go for a ride. There's an area where he's seen something before. He always worries. It doesn't stop. The third thing is, he'll remember how far 
and how fast he's run from that balloon to save his life. So it's the speed and the distance that he'll remember, and that's also logged in his brain. The fourth thing is, is that we can never, ever, ever delete this flight response. We can't get rid of it. It's logged in there forever. And the fifth thing is, which is a tiny glimmer of hope we have, is we can moderate it. We can moderate it. I think of flight as a bit like you've got a pad of paper which has got this thick of pages underneath it, your pad of paper, and you've got a sharp pencil, and you're drawing a figure of eight on the top of the pad. Now, you can moderate it by rubbing out the pencil, but underneath and the top page, you can never get rid of that indentation. It's always there. And if he keeps drawing on that pad of paper, it gets more and more and more of a learnt behaviour. So the indentation in the pad gets deeper and deeper and more difficult to moderate. So the answer is to this, we have to really watch out for flight. And even if the horse goes on to amber, and then he just does this, from here to here, that is flight. And if you're not careful on some horses, it will become this. And then it might come this, rear and away. And this, he builds up more and more of a pattern and alert behaviour to escape from the pink balloon. And then it's not just the pink balloon he gets frightened of. It goes on and on and on. He finds lots of other things that he can do with this. And I'm sure we all recognise this in horses. Some horses have a, a, a bigger flight response it, it, genetically bred inside them, I, it's inherited it. So they have an exaggerated, an, uh, an elevated flight response. These horses, if then they see the pink balloon, or actually you, they will see it miles before you, and they'll be out of here before you've even thought, and you'll think, oh God, what's he shied at this time? Let's call these horses number ones. They can be when a horse looks at a thing and he gets frightened and he's on standby, they can be on standby for flight all the time. So they, as soon as they come out of their stable, and I see a lot of these, and often the owner has no idea that this horse is on standby all the time. I take them out of their stable, as soon as they're out of their stable, <gasps> their breathing comes up. These horses are on edge the whole time, unless we do something about it. And people don't recognise that they're on edge all the time unless they exhibit one of those that are underlined. That's when we start to think badly of it. We don't recognise the tiny bits of flight nearly enough. Then we have, they call that horse number one. He's on amber all the time and he's, he's born like that. So he's collected a huge number much, a lot of data for flight in his head. So by the time he comes to be broken in, he's the more difficult horse to do, unless we know how to deal with it. Then there's the horse number two, <coughs> which is more trainable, probably a competition horse. So he needs a bit of this oomph, oomph in him, this bit of flight, so he can do all the things we need. But he gives you a bit more warning on Amber before he runs from the balloon. So he gives you a bit more time, but he can become a number one if you're not careful. Because he, will, he could learn, if you don't moderate that flight when he runs or does that step away, he could soon learn to, 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 do, these, to do these conflict behaviours in order to get away from the balloon. And if he has a release of pressure when he's trying to get away from the balloon, he will learn it over and over again. And then there's the number three horse, who's your dear little pony that everyone wants their kitty. And um, he sees the pink balloon and he says, oh, I've seen a pink balloon before. And he just walks past it like this. And we all want one of these. God, I would love one of these now. 
and um, they're, like, they're like gold dust, and then they're happy hacker, whatever it is, and this is what you want for your child. Unfortunately, my child never let me buy her one of these. Um, so how on earth do we moderate this flight response? Sorry, Umi, my mic again. That's, like, that's my flight response, fiddling with my thing. Um, how on earth do we moderate this flight response? Well, the Germans would say, you get the horse on the aids. And they're bang on right. Absolutely 100% right. The only tiny trouble is, is that they start with rhythm in their training scale. And rhythm is like a child knowing how to read and write or write a sentence. You need, the horse needs to understand the ABCs of training. And we under, need to understand how he learns. So we need to tap into his, again, we go back to the wild, to understand how he learns. And say this, this flower is an anthill, these flowers. A nose will pop his, her horse will pop his nose on the anthill and uh, bitten by an anthill and he'll go away. The anthill is the stimulus and he gets a release of pressure by running away and the ants go away as he takes a step away. This is his learning theory. We have to tap into it in order to train him. He learns through operant, operant conditioning, trial and error learning, and that's exactly what the anthill is. Negative raw reinforcement is the posh word for pressure release. And this is what all good trainers, whether they know it or not, use to train horses. The one thing I find really interesting when I have a lot of horses in for re-education is that um, they don't know the signals, stop, go, turn and yield, which we use pressure release to teach. But the one they often really don't know is the stop response. So there's the horse's bit in its mouth. And I want this bit, him to understand that this bit means his front legs move, or he either takes a step back with his front legs, or he stops. Now, this mouth is a very long way from his legs. And a horse is often really confused about what that bit is doing in his mouth. So often when I put pressure on his bit, he will do several things. One of the things is this. Either because he's been asked for an outline or because there's too much pressure in his mouth so he tries to get away with it. Or he does this because he just doesn't basically understand the stop response. Or he does this, which is almost the worst one. He charges down onto the bit because he's been taught to go to the bit and have a heavy pressure in the mouth. Wrong answer. Poor horse. He needs to understand that when we put pressure on the bit, it's his front legs we're talking to, and he stops or he takes a step back. I find this over and over and over again with every single horse I've re rehabilitated or had in for education. The mouth is full, stop and turn. These two signals, if he feels stop on both sides of his mouth, it's to stop. If he feels turn on one side, it's to turn his right leg, or on the left side, it's to turn his left leg, and he abducts his whichever leg it is. It's simple. It seems obvious. And when I heard this from Andy McLean, I just thought, oh my God, what? Why have I missed this all my life? Why have I been told never to teach, never to touch this bit? So much, there's so much confusion with training. And I think it's only when you have a problem horse to do that you realise you really have to make things so clear for him. Um, the next thing that we have, to, we have to consider when we're training horses is classical conditioning. This is secondary. And it's your voice, your seat, or your body language. 
and it, it comes in, in front of whatever you're asking him to do. So say you're asking him to go, you could go and then use your leg. And sooner or later, he's going to go off the but you have to always go back to negative reinforcement. And then the last one is positive reinforcement. This is food or a scratch. A scratch, by the way, just behind the withers there, or in front of the withers, is an amazing place and a very handy place for us when we're riding because it actually, if you scratch them there, it actually lowers the heart rate by 10%, I think. Um, and also, uh, I use positive riding, um, positive reinforcement a lot when I'm initially training a horse because it really accelerates the training and the un his understanding. Um, this has been scientifically proven. Um, I now come on to my first horse that I have got to give an example uh, of, of, of of, 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 of how I train. Um, when I'm doing the groundwork with the horse initially, I'm always looking for holes in the training. And I'm always looking at their body and I'm looking at the horse holistically to see how I can, how I can help him in so many ways. It, when I ask him to step back, I'm checking that he can step back easily or that he doesn't go skew with. If when I ask him to turn, he can turn easily. My turn is what how Bruce Logan told me. He takes one front leg back and then he abducts the other. So he really managed to stand up and sit. And all these signals, I'm looking for a hole in the training. What can they do? What they find easy? And Sam is a real example of a hole in a training. And he, I was given. I was rung up one day by somebody called Jan Whitworth, who I didn't know at the time, but I knew she was a really brilliant trainer, and I also knew that she knew about learning theory. So I thought, oh help, um, you know. I don't think I, I said to her, I don't think I can help you, Jan. But she said, come on, two heads are better than one. Let me bring Sam to you. So Sam came along to me, and as I expected, he came so politely off the lorry. He was, groundwork was exemplary, and we took him into the stable. He was calm. Everything was okay. So I thought, how on earth are we going to do this? Because the problem with Sam was that all his groundwork, everything was great, but as soon as she wanted to get on him, he just couldn't cope. He was, just went straight away into flight, into severe flight, as I was doing the work with him, I realized that round his bottom, he was a bit frightened. So I said to Jan, what, what's going on here? And she said, well, actually, he can't have his back feet picked up. Not can't, but he finds it really difficult to. And the blacksmith has a real problem with him. So I said, well, Jan, let's start there then. And I went to pick up his foot. And as I did so, he just wham my hand away and actually destroyed my stable. <laughs> you can imagine it was a really expensive stable. Anyway, um, and so I went and got my ropes that I used for my natural horsemanship. And I, tie, I put one rope round one of his back legs and I held his back leg up and he kicked and kicked and kicked. And then when he relaxed his leg, I put his foot down. And I did this over and over again so I could just pick up the rope, the foot with the rope. After a while, he was quite calm about it, and then I could do the other leg, and I could then pick up his foot with my hand. I won't go into how I put up, put up, picked up his foot with my hand, but you can ask me that in question times. This had the most extraordinary effect on Sam. Uh, we will, Jan and I will never forget it. I've seen this behavior in horses a lot of times, but for Sam, he put his head down, he rolled his little eyes around up into the top of his head, he yawned and yawned and licked and chewed and licked and chewed. It was like he had so relieved that this little bit of flight that was left in his head that he thought was going to kill him if he let his hand leg be picked up. That's what he thought. It's that bad for a horse. And if people just understood that, they wouldn't get cross with them. He was that bad for him. So as soon as he realized we weren't going to hurt him, 
He could have his picked up, foot picked up. It was just like a light bulb for him. I forgot to say, as I was going along, Fan, if every time he had picked his foot up, Jan reinforced it with food, with positive reinforcement. After that, the cards just fell. And I don't exaggerate when I say that half an hour later, he was being ridden around my arena. And he was exemplary because he was so quick to be broken in then, also have a, accept a rider, because Jan had done all the groundwork. And Jan and I often talk about this now. And just look at this little pony. This is not a little pony, he's about 14 too. Look at him. I think he lives quite near here. And he's just a dream. Absolute dream. He's like, look at his posture. He's just beautiful. Everything about Sam, Sam J Jan did the most amazing, amazing job on him. And Jan is now such a good friend. And she did huge things for Daisy and I because she stayed on and she helped me train horses and, and came once or twice a week to help us when, we were, when I was really busy with behaviour horses and with when Daisy was competing at a high level. And she remains a friend to this day. My next horse goes on in slightly the same vein, except B introduced me to Jemima. <laughs> <laughs> and Jemima actually lived down here and belonged to a friend of hers and mine now called Paula. And Jemima was unrideable, basically, and had been given to Paula to see if she could sort out. And if she couldn't, she was told to put her down or shoot her. Um, look how beautiful she is. And so... Jemima came up to me, and her problem was that she reared, bucked, and spun. I think this is probably the, you know, uh, the least she did, to be honest with you. And, um, and I really thought I had my work cut out. She got off the lorry in the normal form, absolutely terrified, whirling around. Duh, duh, duh. I got her into the stable and started work on her. As soon as she understood that stop response in her mouth, she really started to change. And she, of course, she tried, trialed a few of her normal behaviours. But as soon as I said to her, no, I'm going to keep the pressure on until you take that step back and make it, and at least make an attempt at it, um, Jemima. As soon as she realised that actually all she had to do to get a release of pressure was to take her foot back, she started to try harder, she started to realise there was an answer, there was always going to be an answer to my question, because I was tapping into her learning theory. Now, the more I asked Jemima, the more I started to realise that her body was really holding her back. She was so on her forehand, because often horses that exhibit these behaviours are really ridden in a way that they're being told, you will not do this, you will be here, you will be... Or they're strapped down or whatever to stop them doing stuff. And so this had caused her to be in a really uncomfortable position. And the next thing that really helped her was this turn where she had to back up, open this left shoulder. When I first asked her, she couldn't... Because she was so weighted over here... And I see a lot of horses that are weighted over here. And I think it's something to do with the fact that we lead them on the left-hand side. And so they're always a bit like that. Um, and so when I first asked her to pick up her front foot, sorry, you can't see over there, she could pick it up about this high. By the time I'd finished, she could do this. And again, she did a Sam on me at this point. She, she licked and chewed, and it was a, had a huge effect on her. I then took her into the arena. And you would have thought my arena was super, super, super spooky. Everybody hated me for it who came for lessons. <laughs> it had deer one side, duck pond with ducks and geese flying off it. I had turkeys. I had all sorts of things that were really frightening for horses. But that was what I wanted because I wanted to get them to a stage where they didn't they were so on the aids that they'd walk past the turkey. So I needed things like this to train the horse or that I had in for education. Jemima never looked at them. I don't remember if you remember, Paula. She didn't, wasn't bothered by them at all. 
And then when I started to do a little bit of saying, come on, get your hind leg underneath you, bend your body, get your shoulders up, that was the turning point. She just changed. So what I'm trying to say about Jemima and about a lot of horses is that the brain and the body are linked together. You cannot separate them. And you have to think of both those things in order to get your horse to where you want him to be. They're inextricably linked. So it was both Jemima's mind and her body that I need to fix. And she never looked back. Paula was amazing with the groundwork and she still does it religiously and we still have a lot of fun working together with lots of horses. And she's helped so many horses get back into, into being, being able to be ridden again since that memorable day. Paula was there for, the, for a weekend with me and on the second day Paula did all the groundwork and she rode her. And she's gone on to be one of Paula's best horses. This is an example of um, a before and after. Now, I didn't take these photos after, and I'm very bad about taking before and afterwards, after, but a kind client did this. And this was the horse when he arrived with me, and this is when he went. It wasn't long afterwards. It was only about four or five weeks. But you can see the change in him and how on the before he's really loaded on his front end and he looks a bit sad, and his head looks big. This is what happens when a horse starts to carry himself how he should in what I call his correct natural posture. You can see his head looks smaller. I'm afraid, I'm sorry he's not standing square, that always annoys me, but I didn't take the photograph. But you can see he's much more loaded on his hind legs, or at least equally. But this isn't a finished job at all. He did come from me for behaviour problems, and they were gone in a trice, and I concentrated on his, 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 his posture for, for most of the time he was with me. But I had huge help. I had help from this wonderful osteopath called Gavin Schofield, who trains the nervous system to remember where they should naturally be. And I had a friend called Carol Brett, who I miss hugely, who had... Who had um, a saddle company called Balance Saddles, and they were the first people to really understand that the saddle could affect a horse's way of going. And he had a balance saddle especially for him. And these three things changed him. And he, again, he never looked back. My favorite horse of all time, I have to say, was this little horse called Little Mickey Finn. <laughs> and my daughter, Daisy, made me buy him. When we went to the dealer to look at several horses, there was a very nice little grey standing in the corner, and then there was Mickey Finn that she brought out first. She obviously was desperate to sell him. There was a 23-year-old boy riding him. He had such a tight noseband on, you could see where the mark had been, where he'd had it on. Um, and They must have ended up with a crank, but he still managed to get his tongue out, and there was still foam flying around. And Mickey Finn was behaving so badly, but this boy was very strong. And Daisy said to me, Mom, I want to ride that pony. And so I let her. And she had a honeymoon period on him, of course, because she wasn't really doing battle with him. And she'd done a lot of natural horsemanship at this stage. So she really showed him stuff that he hadn't known before. So we had this time when he was pretty nice. And I found myself writing out a cheque um, for meat money for him. And I had a sleepless night that night before I went to get him in the trailer because I just think, kept thinking, what have I done? And I was right because we got him home and he was completely unrideable. He really was. And I did, I had, uh, the only thing I had in those days was my natural horsemanship. So he got very good on the ground and he got calmer. But Mickey Finn, was one, a number one horse through and through, plus, plus, plus number one. He was on amber the whole time, in the stable, in the field, walk, field walking, box walking, in the box, he'd swing his tongue around, his head around. The, the dentist said to me, you'll never get that horse still in the mouth. And I thought, I will. I blooming well will. And then I thought, but I don't know how, but I'll find out. 
and by pure chance, and I always think things happen for a reason, I met a man, a scientist called Andrew McLean, and he talked to me about the science behind training horses. And I realized I had a really deep hole in my training. So I went over to Australia and I spent a month with them. And they taught me everything about the, the um, scientific principles. And he also, I also learned the evidence-based techniques of really training horses, these things I talked to you before, the negative reinforcement um, and the learning theory of the horse. And this changed Mickey Finn. Two years later, I was standing outside a big arena, a big, and in the Khan in Northern Ireland. And I heard the commentator say, and this is Daisy Usher riding for Great Britain on little Mickey Finn. And I still feel tears prick when I think about it. And my hairs all stand on end. Because this was such an achievement, not because he came second and because he was the best of the British, but because little Mickey Finn had come so far. And it was such um, a hard work and it was the most wonderful day I think I've ever had in my training of horses. And I just have to say, which I forgot to say earlier on, Mickey Finn did all these. <laughs> There wasn't one he didn't do. Not one. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> so if you want a horse that you really enjoy riding, for wh whatever discipline you have, it's really important we understand that flight response and we understand how to moderate it. Um, if you want him to be obedient and willing, you need to be able to tap into that learning theory and really teach him the signals over and over again. He's not wired up to remember them. So you have to teach him every day. And then to use his body correctly is one of the most important things too for him, for the horse. All these things are for the horse. If we do it for the horse, we'll get the rewards. This is a picture drawn by my brother, my brilliant brother. And I think this sum, his words just sum it up. We have a long way to go, sighed the boy. Yes, but look how far we've come, said the horse. Thank you so very much for listening. And please, any questions are so welcome. Thank you. I hope you all um, have uh, some questions to ask Sarah now. Later, not we do that later. After, I think. After, 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 after. <laughs> after.
Come on. Yeah, are you ready, Pep? Are we ready? Am I turned on? Oh, yes, I think I am. Um, right. What we're going to do is some people have uh, written questions in break time, which is lovely, and others probably want to ask questions um, face to face with Sarah. So I'll, I'm going to start from here and say that the first question is, You've got very tidy writing, whoever wrote this. Um, I'm on an ec Can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah? I'm on an equine degree, and they love uh, McLean and McGreevy, but really down on round pen Monty Roberts stuff. I've been scared to put up my hand and admit in class that I've done some round pen, I think to good effect. What are your thoughts on this? Um, first of all, can I address the person who's ask the question. Good question. And you may have noticed I didn't really say much about round pen work. But what I say about all trainers is you can never poo-poo a trainer. It's the worst thing you could do. That round pen work has probably saved hundreds of horses from a life that might have been misery. But on the other hand, Andrew McLean is right to a certain extent, that lots of horses don't respond to the round pen work, work. And those are those number one horses, the extreme flight ones. And I think Monty is very clever because he, before he puts a horse in a round pen, he checks it out. And if it's a number one or a one horse on amber, he knows that it probably will go round and round that round pen. And I had one like this, went round and round the round pen and didn't ever really turn and face. But I think Monty has a huge talent for reading horses and getting the timing right. And I agree with, I met Paul McGreevy when I was out in Australia. He was there with Andrew at the time. He's not, he's, he's a scientist, he's not a horseman. And I think Monty Roberts is a horseman. And I think it's very dangerous and not right to criticise somebody when they're doing so much with horses. That is correct. But I understand because putting a horse into flight mode when it has an association with you is probably not the right thing to do. Does that make sense? I don't know whether that's what you've been taught. Do you talk? Yeah. The flight. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely true. But actually, when I did my Pirelli, we did a lot of round pen rent work, but we never sent the horse into flight. And what we did is we learnt to use our body language in such a way that we could draw the horse to us, and we could send it away. And then you became to have a communication with the horse. And communication with the horse is what it's all about. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to work the horse in a round pen. In fact, it can really, really help a horse. So everything I've talked about on that thing can really horse about. You can't, anybody, if, uh, what I've learned over the years, if anybody does anything to a horse and they have results, you can't say it's wrong. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, the number one and it did, and, and, and what happened? Yeah. And um, I took him to the livery yard and I thought they were going to help me there because it was a riding school and I thought, well, you know, they'll teach me, they'll show me what to do. But none of them would come near <laughs> because he was just like, just needing him out. He just started yeah. rearing and going crazy. So they had a round pen there and I just thought, well, all I can do really is just go into a round pen with him, 
take off all his hair and just be there with him and see what happens. And um, I just I just sensed him got him to go round and then to got him to turn. Yeah, and, and, and what you're doing there is exactly what all good horsemen do. And you're having control, your stimulus control over his legs. And it doesn't really matter how you do this. So as long as you're controlling the speed and the direction of the horse, you're actually doing the same as you would if you had him in a stable and you had a bridle on him and you're doing the groundwork that... Andrew McLean suggests you do and Paul McGreevy with this evidence-based training which is like magic but really I think you, you know it, it you doesn't matter how you do it so if you're yeah of course okay okay Pat we'll give you okay, another Pat. on 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 Thank, no, thank you. Good question. Really great question. Um, so the next question is, what's your opinion on bitless or liberty bridle riding? I know what her opinion is. Can you just check that everyone can see this? Sorry? Can you just check that everyone can see this? Can everyone hear? Yeah. yeah. So, so, the, so the question is about using, you know, bitless bridles or uh, liberty riding what what what's uh, what's your view on that um but that's two real separate questions really um bitless riding um is 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 fine because you just have to teach obviously the stop and go from the noseband and 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 liberty riding mm. is classical conditioning so you're, the horse is le learning from your seat, um, uh, and um, really, and there's no contact with the bit at all. So he has to listen to your your body to stop, and that's fine um, if you continually train. That's what Pirelli was really. It's constant classical conditioning. But you, if you're going to be really safe on a horse, you, the horse needs to understand the signal in the mouth as well. Um, and, um, I, and it's great to be able to ride your horse at liberty. I did it masses. I could jump at liberty. I mean, I could jump without a bridle on with just a rope round its blooming neck. But, uh, and this was, this was a magic thing to do. But actually, um, it depends what you want to do. If you want to ride your horse bareback and bridleless, then go ahead and teach him this. But if you want to go and compete and go into a dressage arena and do all these things, you can't do it like that so it's conditioning a horse to do what you want him to do and if you want to ride him without a bridle then go and teach him to ride without a bridle if you want to, I want to go and I want to compete or not me particularly but I want to teach people all the people I teach want to compete they want to be in the real world very few people want to learn to ride bridleless and saddleless it, it, from the people I find. So I don't teach it very much because it takes a long time to learn. Natural horsemanship, getting the timing, getting everything right is really not easy. And it's a fantastic thing, but it's almost a separate thing that's out here. Whereas I want to be in the midst of it all and just help horses to be happier not necessarily to be ridden at liberty. You know, it takes somebody with extreme skill. These men that ride horses with the four either side of them, I can begin to do that. But Pat, come on, you've done that. Yeah, of course I have. You know, not, meaning. <laughs> <laughs> not meaning. To. Not meaning to. <laughs> um, does that, where are, who's, who answered that? Who asked that question? Oh, yeah. again, uh, so, 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 so that's what I feel about that, really. Um, it's really what you want. To, you can train a horse to do anything. You can get him to stop by picking your nose if you want to. And it just, you just, you, yeah. it's, it's, it, 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 it's all like tapping into his learning theory. Um, Does that answer your question? Your next, the next one is, uh, what is your opinion on use of the whip in horse racing? That's also a really good question. Sorry about using my thing. 
first. Is it lucky now? Talk, talk, Pat. Um, the whip in racing, I think, as a general thing, it doesn't matter whether you're racing or whether you're on the pony club. The whip should mean one thing, and that's go. It's the back up to your leg. I train the whip when I'm using, when I'm teaching a horse to go from the leg. So when I'm on doing my groundwork, I stand with the horse in front of me and I tap, tap, tap where the leg should be. And where the leg would be and quite often I have to tap about 50 or 60 times before that horse knows to take a step forward. So as long as the horse knows that when you tap him with the stick that he, if the answer is, the correct answer is he goes, then I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Whip should not be used as punishment. So if that rider says to that horse, come on, here we're going flying out, taps him, and the horse knows, Cry, I've got to go now. Because don't forget, jockeys have very short stirrups, and their legs are, you know, they can ride with their bodies. So actually, probably, it, I don't know, but it might be more, it, it might be better, and I'm just saying this off the cuff, and it's probably completely wrong. It might, instead of really using your body a lot and, dis and making the horse come off balance by your body, if you could just tap him gently and say, come on, and he knew that meant he picked up his hind leg and he brought himself uphill and he poof, fired, off your, fired off that whip, that would be much more ethical than having to ride him like they do and unbalance him and put him on his forehand. Much better if he knows what the whip tap knows. But you have to train it. Like anything, you have to train it over and over again. It shouldn't be a flight response. The whip should not be a flight response. So when you use it, he should not go into flight. It should be, he should know that it means he goes. Does that make sense? Who, was, who asked you? the question? That's um, you again. The next, the next uh, question we have is, um, my 11-2 pony is frightened of pigs. What? What can I what can I do about it? I mean, not my 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 eleven two pony. Your eleven two pony is frightened of pigs. Again, you have to really train the responses well. So, uh, if a pony sees a pig, there's lots of he will probably stop and look at the pig. Now, sometimes if a horse stops and look at the pig, you just need to give him a moment to look probably about 15 seconds, something like that. And then you can very gently ask him to go on. And then you could ask him to stop again. And then you could ask him to go on and stop again. And then ask him to go on and stop again. And then you could make a turn into the pig, but you can't, what I call, flood the horse. So you must do everything as far away from the pig as he can tolerate. You don't want to say to him, you will come and be next to that pig and you'll do everything here. You need to find really where that transition point is between him being okay with the pig and not being, just not being okay with the pig and, and ease it in so that you do it by degrees. So after a while, he will just be on the aids and he'll walk past the pig. But you have to do it by degrees, and you have, he has to know your signals really well before you take him to the pig. But it is about letting him see it first for a little while, but not really close. You can't say to him, you will go and stand by the pig. But eventually, what you're asking for him is to be relaxed by the pig. And I would probably do it, I might do it on the ground first near the pig. I might, depending on the horse, particularly with a 12-hand pony, it'd be easy, you know... It, it, it just depends on the horse and his flight response, but you'd have to do it so you really didn't cause him ever to run from the pig too much. As soon as he's run from the pig, you, you, you start to have a problem. You've got to get it so he, he can tolerate it or you're not flooding him. Um. Oh, sorry. Um, the next question is, um, what is your view about punishment? We're talking about your husband, not... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
he's used to that. He's become completely habituated to punishment now. <laughs> um, punishment. Um, I think when I want to use punishment on a horse, it's slightly, I've come to the end of my, I've, I've run out of answers. And I think that's the trouble with punishment is you've run, by the time you have to use punishment, you've run out of answers. You don't know what else to do. Um, and all it does is send the horse into more flight. So it's not the answer because it just makes him more frightened of whatever the object is. And remember, he'll remember that more. So he'll remember not only the pink balloon, but he'll remember that by the pink balloon, he also got hit, and that made him more frightened. So it's not a brilliant thing to do. It might work, but it's not long-lasting. And particularly, um, I dislike it when horses are jumping, because if you hit your horse when he's refused, you turn him around and you hit him, he goes into flight. And then you turn him to the fence, and he might jump it, but he'll jump it flat. And this is really dangerous, particularly for children, because if he learns to jump a fence in flight, and don't get me wrong, oh my goodness, what did I do for most of my life? <laughs> but now I realize that you, you cannot send a horse into flight when you're jumping. You have to retrain the go response better and make it easier for the horse to get the right answer over the fence and then build it up. Mickey Finn was actually a failed show jumper. And so when we got him, he refused things this high. And we really had to retrain that, not by hitting him but retraining the go response and really rewarding him in a positive way if he jumped this high. Now, you know how big those intermediate fences are. They're huge in the, in the, in the BE world for a 14-2 pony. And by the end of his career, he was just... Right. Um, right, we've got another question. Do Would you approach training a working stallion the same as, say, a hunter when uh, you're leading it? Or yeah, that, that's an excellent question. All horses learn the same way. It doesn't matter if it's a mare, a stallion, a gelding, a whatever. I don't know what else there is. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they all have this same learning theory. Now, stallions often have learned to do a lot of things we wouldn't want them to do. And so they might, when you're teaching a stallion, you teach them exactly the same thing as you would any other horse. There's no difference in them at all. The only thing with stallions is, is that people think that they, there's now new evidence from Andrew McLean again, that people think, people used to think they, there was a hierarchy in the herd. Actually, the only time a stallion gets aggressive or wants to fight is when another stallion is to try and take it, comes in to try and take over his herd. That's it. He's not rounding up his mares. He's not doing this sort of thing. He he's wants to protect his own ground and his own mares. But it, that's only when another stallion comes in. So really, he's just a horse, and he has the same learning as everything else. But he may have learnt a lot of those conflict behaviors on his way through life because people think of stallions as being different and I've worked with quite a lot of stallions and as soon as they understand clear signals and they understand the stop go and turn then you can lead them quite calmly past other mares in a field once they know your signals and they learn you can moderate this flight response um, so it's, they're no different, no, they're, they're no different. They might take a bit more skill or a bit more, sh you have to be a bit quicker, all these things, but they learn, this. you never forget, all horses learn the same way. Um, yeah, so that, that's my answer to that question. Um, and then we've got, uh, have you ever had a horse you've not been able to train? Um, uh, of course. 
the answer is, of course, God, I would be um, God if I, if, I, if I wasn't. But the main reason I find that you can't get any further with a horse is normally due to pain. And often I find that if it, the, be, these behaviours crop up, say, what I, what I start to really notice in a horse is, say they, have, they might have three good days when they're really good and suddenly they explode again. And people think, oh, he's been okay for these three days. It's often pain. This is often a, 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 a signal. Of, and it's often buried so deep that sometimes vets can't find it. But always be aware that it could be pain because that's been my experience. And I always look out for it because pain is the, is, is the thing that causes the things that you can't always help in a horse. If that keeps creeping up, it's really impossible because that causes a flight response. And sometimes those flight responses are not controllable when the pain creeps in. The, the other thing that I think happens a bit is that, um, say, I've had clients that I'm getting somewhere with the horse, but it's going to take me longer than I thought. That sometimes is time. Not very often, um, but sometimes that happens. And then the other thing that happen is that maybe a client, the horses maybe just, yeah, they bought a horse which is the wrong horse for them. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? That it's maybe a number one horse, and they should have a number three horse or a low number two horse. Um, and so this horse is always going to be a bit too quick for them, and their skill set because they haven't done this, what I'm talking about a lot, is not enough to keep this horse's flight response down and his behaviours down. And so that's when it goes wrong um, a, a little bit. And so then he would come back for me for extra behaviour. But you know that it would, as soon as he had an association with his rider again, that, it would come, that this flight response would rear its head again. Because remember, it never goes away. This is the trouble. Does that answer your question? Is that, yeah. I would, I would like to just uh, say something I have uh, noticed. Um, I've spent a lot of time watching Sarah teaching. And last year, I think it was, Paula and Sarah and I, we went to see Charlotte Dujardin and give her a few top tips before she went into the <laughs> arena. But um, she, she was one of the few people who, um, and she talked about her, her training regime, and she said, the minute, the minute I touch a horse, um, I'm saying to the horse, your lesson has begun. Now, as I said, I, I, I spent many hours watching Sarah, and all too often, uh, you turn up there and um, bracelets in the stable and uh, the owner goes in there and um, they slap a saddle and bridle on it, drag it out of the stable and get on it and think, right, now we're going to have a lesson. Well, you know, the poor horse, what they should have done is said, you know, hello, bracelet, I'm a human, you're a horse and I'm going to do your bridle and I'm going to do your saddle and I'm going to open the stable door and you're going to stand there until I ask you not to stand there. So, so a horse doesn't understand suddenly, you know, when the lesson begins like we That's do. That's so true. That's so, so the true. the lesson always begins the minute you touch that horse, the lesson has begun. The but minute, people will go and drag that horse. You're absolutely right. The minute you see it, the yeah. minute it sees you in the field. <laughs> but but um, uh, so so many people, or, or the other way around, they'll finish their lesson. And um, by the way, you never see a horse patting another horse. They don't understand what being slapped on the neck is about. <laughs> it's an awful <laughs> human thing, you know. And as Sarah said, you must scratch them. That's what horse talk is. Not a wallop around the neck <laughs> um, and and they and then you get off your horse and you you attack it with a hose pipe and then you I don't know, put a rug on it or something and then you you go right lesson over and you drag it out to the field well what you should be doing is going stand still and we're going to go two steps at a time one step at a time six steps backwards one step forward because the lesson is not over until it is free but people just think once you get off, then these rules don't apply. Or before you get on, these rules don't apply. Yeah, that's so really, the that's poor really horse is so confused before you've even 
started. So that is what I've learned from watching Sarah. That's so true. That really is true. Anyway, does anyone else want to ask a question before we put her back in her cupboard? <laughs> in her stable. <laughs> yeah? No? Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. It's been fascinating. Is that all right, Umi? Sarah is resident in Darsham, so if any of you want to get hold of her with your problem ponies, you know, you know where she is, or Umi <laughs> can help you. Don't okay, her, thank you all very, very much for coming. And, and thank you, Umi. saying you're not going to invite me again. <laughs> anyway, we really had a good time, guys. And uh, with virtual reality and 2000 Should we dance? And 22 is our 10th year anniversary. So it'll be a very special year. Fantastic. Very special program. Well done, Umi. Well done.